children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Um, thank you, Lois Sand, for leading, and Eric Long for fulfilling our M46A promise. So, all right. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Um, I did get word that Pastor Bob arrived safely in Costa Rica, although it was very mean of him to tell me that he was enjoying 90 degree weather, so. <laughs> But we're very glad that he is able to go on vacation. So praise God for safe travels. So I'm going to reread our texts for today. Um, and you can turn there if you'd like. John 1, verses 29 through 34. So John 1, 29 through 34. Jesus, the Lamb of God. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look! the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the holy spirit i have seen and i testify that this is the son of god someone recently asked me a question like this how do you know what jesus really said when he himself did not write the words in the bible the words came from those around Jesus who heard him, interpreted his words, and ascribed wrote them down. I pondered that question for a while. At that time, I didn't really have a stellar answer, but I thought more about it and came to the conclusion that number one, it's simply about faith. But also it comes down to the fact that we serve a living God. Christ as God's gift to us was not just a good role model or a sacrificial lamb. This gift did not stop at death. This gift kept giving when Christ overcame death and became our living savior. Now when I think of a life to live any other way except for believing that he's alive, he's with us, and our saving grace, to me it's truly frightening. Where would our hope come from? Now, I admit that maybe imagining a life lived any other way is frightening only because I grew up in a Christian home. But to be honest, when you do study other world religions and what they believe, or when you see idols become gods to people, you see that those are empty. Empty of joy, empty of fulfillment, empty of a living Jesus who God confirmed to us through the Holy Spirit. And he was confirmed as a way to bridge the gap between our messiness and God's holiness. In our text today, we bring in the Holy Spirit, confirming that Christ is the Holy One that was foretold. While this text is not always a part of Advent themes, the more I studied, the more I realized that this section truly enhances the Christmas narrative. When you dig into the story, details, and life of Jesus that is recorded in the Bible, you find that there are so many prophecies fulfilled and so many things that lined up so perfectly that it's hard not to conclude that God truly did have this all perfectly lined up. Now before I get to the Holy Spirit stuff, I want to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. What I want to point out from the text is that John played a really specific role in Christ's coming. And we can learn a tremendous amount from John. In my studying of John the Baptist, I stumbled upon things I did not know. But first, when you think of John the Baptist, you probably think of someone who looks like this. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and as I will mention, scripture does pretty much support that image. The more I looked into the role and the story of John the Baptist, the more it enriches the story and the miracle of Christ's coming. 
Luke 1, 5 tells us that he, John the Baptist was born to aged Jewish parents named Zacharias and Elizabeth, and they were of a priestly family. So his birth and life in and of itself is a miracle because I'm sure at that time, it was pretty rare for couples to start a family in their golden years. Not only that, but the birth was, birth was perfectly timed with, with Mary's. Luke 180 also tells us that he was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. So he basically lived in the, de in the desert until he was ready to prepare the way of the Lord. We don't know what his living conditions were, but we do know that he had clothes of camel's hair and basically ate like a poor person. Matthew 11:18 tells us he didn't socialize a lot and that people thought he was demon possessed. So it might be safe to say that if you lived in that time and saw John the Baptist, you'd, you'd think he was a little strange. A writer named Wayne Jackson wrote an article about John the Baptist and says this, John did not seek out the multitudes, rather somehow he attracted them. John the Baptist, perhaps a homeless looking man who people thought was strange, had a compelling message that attracted Jesus. That message was about the coming of Jesus. I'm sorry, he had a compelling message that attracted people. And that message was about Jesus. He had a following even before he baptized Jesus. And he was so popular that Herod Antipas, the ruler at that time, was also interested in what John the Baptist had to say. What's more ironic is that Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus. To me, this is just another miraculous twist in the Christmas story. I have to wonder, had Herod's wife not hated John the Baptist so much and cunningly ordered his death, would Herod have come to faith? I have no answer, but it's just a thought. So one thing we learn from John the Baptist is that we don't have to dress up the message of Christ in order for others to be attracted to it. I just read through a book um, called Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream by David Platt. In the one chapter, he talks about modern day churches. Um, and I'll just read to you a segment that really made me pause. <clears throat> So he's talking about what it takes to run and grow a successful church. And he says this, first, we need a good performance. Next, we need a place to hold the crowds that will come. So we gather all our resources to build a multi-million dollar facility to house this performance. Finally, once the crowds get there, we need to have something to keep them coming back. So we need to start programs. First class, top of the line programs for kids, for youth, for families, for every age and stage. In order for these programs, in order to have these programs, we need professionals to run them. That way, for example, parents can simply drop off their kids at the door and the professionals can handle the ministry for them. We don't want people trying this at home. I know this may sound oversimplified and exaggerated, but are these not the elements we think of when we consider growing dynamic, successful churches in our day? I get flyers on my desk every day advertising entire conferences built around creative communication, first-rate facilities, innovative programs, and entrepreneurial leadership in the church. We Christians are living out the American dream in the context of our communities of faith. We have convinced ourselves that if we can position our resources and organize our strategies and in church as in every other sphere of life, we can accomplish anything we set our minds to. But what is strangely lacking in the picture of performances, personalities, programs, and professionals is a desperation for the power of God. God's power is at best an add-on to our strategies. I am frightened by the reality that the church I lead can carry on most of our activities smoothly, efficiently, even successfully, 
never realizing that the Holy Spirit of God is virtually absent from the picture. We can so easily deceive ourselves, mistaking the presence of physical bodies in a crowd for the existence of a spiritual life in a community. After reading that, I just had to pause and kind of ask forgiveness because I know I've been guilty of that. I think that in churches, we have to redefine what success means in terms of the kingdom of God. In my humble opinion, I think Conestoga is doing a really good job at following the Holy Spirit and relying on the Holy Spirit leading. I believe that the gospel in its rawest form is enough for what people today are seeking. And John the Baptist was a great example of that. Studies show that today, people are very interested in who and what Jesus is. Even millennials are fascinated by Jesus. Oftentimes, I'm sharing the gospel in the unlikeliest of places, the doctor's office, a conversation with a new friend, a conversation with a stranger. People are interested. And John the Baptist shows us that it's the truths and the testimonies of Jesus that attract people. Another thing to pull out of this text today is the Holy Spirit coming to Jesus in the form of a dove. This is so significant that all four Gospels mention this happening upon Jesus' baptism. And this, happening, and this happened almost like a foreshadowing of what's going to be given to all of Jesus' followers. I found an article in Charisma magazine comparing the dove with the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Some of the interesting comparisons were this. A dove is commonly white, and white in scriptures repre represents purity or righteousness. A dove expresses its, its affection by stroking its young and cooing in a soft tone. Similarly, the Holy Spirit causes believers to be caring and loving towards one another. A dove is a gentle creature and never retaliates against its enemies. Believers in Matthew 5 are told to turn the other cheek and pray for our enemies. A dove will not attack if its young is attacked. It cries out in distress. Romans 8 tells us that if we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will intercede with its groanings. There are many other interesting comparisons, but the point is that the dove introduces us to who the Holy Spirit is. I was reading in Exodus 40 the other day, and it was about how God's spirit was only in the tabernacle after it was all set up to God's specifications. The Old Testament Israel did not have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Priscilla Shire in her Bible study, Discerning the Voice of God, says this, God's people in the Old Testament would have given their left arm for the 24-7 whole life access to the Holy Spirit that we as believers in this age enjoy. Only certain people of the priestly lineage at that time were allowed into the presence of God, but we have been given a gift. One could almost contrast the tabernacle presence with the dove, where the dove represents a freedom. Birds of the air seem to come and go as they please, and maybe that's like the Holy Spirit in our lives, free to move. In light of this text today, Christmas is not just about Jesus as the gift, but that he ushered in so much more than himself. He ushered in God's plan and gave us the Holy Spirit when he left this earth. If you want to turn in your Bibles again, um, I'm going to read in John 20, um, where Jesus appears to his disciples. So John 20:19 20, through 22 says this. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Two times, Jesus says to his disciples, Peace be with you. 
This is such an important aspect of the Holy Spirit. When discerning the Holy Spirit movement, oftentimes peace is associated with its promptings. Again, Priscilla Shire says, when the Spirit is speaking, he causes you to experience peace inside. Not a dreamy, wistful, holding hand in a circle peace, but a peace that is strong, intense, palpable, and real. I have recently experienced this peace and the Holy Spirit leading um, in my life. So there's an alternate uh, lunch ministry that happens at Twin Valley Middle School called Cafe 101. This lunch serves as a smaller setting than the big lunch room. The students who attend come there for a variety of reasons, but the goal is to provide a room staffed by caring adults where students can eat their lunches feeling welcome, loved, and safe. When I first moved into the area and heard about this, it had always caught my attention, but the timing never seemed right. A few weeks ago, a local pastor sent out an email saying they needed volunteers for this lunch, which by the way, I'm gonna put in a shameless plug here. If something like this sounds interesting to you and you would like to volunteer for this, please let me know. It's a great ministry. I responded by saying that I am available and willing, however, I can only do, on, do Mondays. I received a celebration email from the woman who was in charge of this program um, that said, we just lost one of our volunteers for Mondays. It felt like such a Holy Spirit confirmation coming from her and from me. I started going in for lunches two weeks ago and for some people, going into a classroom full of middle school students would terrify them. Honestly, I look forward to this time spent with these kids and find such a peace in being there. I don't think I always would have felt this way, but the Holy Spirit has instilled in me a peaceful confirmation of his timing and strength. The Holy Spirit confirmed through a dove that Christ was who John the Baptist says he was. In the same way, the Holy Spirit confirms in us where we should go and prompts us to do what we need to do. Praise God for that extra gift ushered into the Christmas story. As I think about the fact <coughs> that Jesus is the Holy Spirit confirmed way, I can't help but to mourn for those who are hurting and without a savior. I see the girl who has depression has no hope and it affects her whole being. Maybe Jesus won't take her depression away, but he sure helps. I see those affected by social media who just end up comparing their lives to this perpetual Christmas card that is portrayed on social media. The only, they only see the good things happening in others' lives and thinks everyone else has a perfect life. Mine doesn't even stack up. If everyone just stayed off of social media or at least cut back significantly, and instead devote our attention to Jesus, we would find that we are beloved and nothing, I mean nothing else matters. I know the perpetual dehumanizing and devaluing of life through war or sex trafficking. Jesus is not beyond healing the broken and miserable parts of this world. When all seems lost, it's important to remember that Christ is alive. He heals and the spirit transforms. Maybe someone came to mind that you know who is struggling, hurting, needs Jesus, or just needs healing. A quote by Adam S. McHugh says, a hurting person is in a storm. They are cold, wet, shivering, and scared. Preaching platitudes and advice will not get them out of the storm. Don't tell a person in a storm that it's a sunny day. There will likely come a day when the clouds part, but it's not today. It's not your job to pull them out of the storm. It's your job to get wet with them. The world was given a gift at Christmas, Jesus ushering in the continuation of God's plan. We know that Jesus is the way, but sometimes it takes longer for others to see that. I found that quote in the book, Someone to Tell It To, Move With Compassion. And it's about two men who started a ministry in Harrisburg um, called Someone to Tell It To. 
basically it's a listening ministry um, that gives helps people to feel valued and have dignity to be listened to and cared for. And this book is helping me to realize that before we can give, any, give others any sort of hope, we need to sit with people in their suffering and empathize with them in their agony. This is so hard to do, especially when we are a fix it now kind of people. And if you think about your lives and how far God has brought you, it's easy to see how patient, loving, and kind God is. Maybe during this Christmas season, extend those attributes of God to someone who's hurting. And don't let it end with Christmas, but just remember that it's not our job to pull people out of their storm. That's reserved for the Holy Spirit movement. But we can be God's instruments to just sit with someone in their storm, so at least it's not so lonely. So I'm gonna leave you with a really strange image. Um, this may either cause you to remember this sermon or maybe you'll contact Pastor Bob and question my sanity. Um, but just stick with me. So this is our dog, Moose. This is our dog, Moose, with her head in our Christmas tree. So I never had a dog growing up, but when I got married, Moose came with Dan. So I had no choice. She's a fascinating dog because every once in a while she goes into what I call slow motion. And if you have ever met our dog, you know that she is an energetic dog. So this is mid slow motion. I think she enjoys the feeling of the Christmas tree or anything really. It could be a tablecloth, spider plant, whatever. She enjoys the feeling of it lightly running down her head and her neck. She's super weird, I know. So I show this picture to you because she is doing this the other night and it just struck me. She takes time out of her very busy life, eating, sleeping, running around, to just feel and immerse herself and her senses in what she's seeing, feeling, and smelling. She immerses so much that she slowly savors what she's experiencing. So I encourage you this Advent season, and Advent and Christmas season, to slowly savor and experience the Christmas story. Be in slow motion with the Christmas story. Put yourself in the story and imagine what John the Baptist was like and how radical his message was at the time. Think about the dove that came to confirm Jesus. Think about what that dove represents about the Holy Spirit, maybe even research the life of doves and compare and contrast that with the Holy Spirit. And finally, immerse yourself into the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit that Christ ushered in to us through his birth. And take time to thank God where the Holy Spirit has led and just how far God has brought you in life. As this year comes to a close, evaluate where the Holy Spirit is leading you to enter into someone else's storm so that you can be an instrument of hope. And immerse yourself in praise to God for sending his son to save us. Amen. Amen.